geographers. We're going to get back into this stuff. We're going to talk more about geography. Last time I was getting into things like thinking spatially, the idea of space and place and this concept of you know context, this where stuff is taking place. Now I want to uh, shift a, a little bit more to um, you know, just the, the, the discipline of geography, geography as a field of study. And to do so, we'll, uh, we'll kind of follow along with a lot of what your uh, textbook author, Steve Graves, is, is getting into in his first chapter of the book, Introduction to Human Geography, a Disciplinary Approach. And so this discipline idea, I'll get into what Steve has to say about that. Um, we'll also cover this, this whole idea of geographers as Jedis, uh, which is Steve's deal here uh, as well. Some of the, the Northridge students are, are all into, you can, you can embrace that or not, but we'll, we'll cover that and we'll get into these core concepts of geography as well. These, these themes, these thematic elements that are consistent, no matter what it is we're talking about, no matter what the actual subject matter is we're studying, if we're geographers, this is how we approach that. All right, and, and with this too, I think what I'll wind up doing is I'll talk, you know, like item one, I'll cover that, and then maybe I'll stop this, and then I'll make another video and get into two and three, probably lump those together. Um, yeah, just because if, if for no other reason, it's easier for me to pause this and uh, talk to myself alone in a room for shorter periods of time than lengthy periods all at once, all right? So so expect this will be like part one of two, uh, right? That's that's how we'll move forward. All right. Um, <clears throat> to get to this idea of a, uh, a discipline, right, uh, Steve will, he contrasts it against this idea of a subject. And he's got, I think he's got like a, a Jeopardy board up there. Geography is a subject, which is what what you get in in school. In elementary school, in high school, geography is that subject where you learn some facts about the world, about the physical world or the cultural world around us, and that's it. It's just it's just cute fun stuff that we memorize. Um, so things like, you know, what's the longest river in the world or the tallest mountain or things like that. Uh, my first introduction to geography um, was through these countries and capitals tests I had in middle school. Where I had a great, he was a history teacher, one of the greatest teachers I ever had, uh, and he forced us to learn the name and the capital city and the location of every single country in the world, right, at that moment in time in the late 80s early 90s whenever that was right some of these some of these are, are long since gone have different names but you know um some of the classics have have stuck around so yeah we had these tests where we would have to memorize this stuff and it was awful i mean it, it good in the sense that i got a sense of where some countries were it introduced me to this this concept of the subject of geography, but it didn't do much for me. Ultimately, like knowing the capital city of a place, does that does that matter at all for anything for anyone ever? I don't think so. Personally speaking, as a geographer, uh, that's why I don't make you guys do this kind of stuff. Um, we maybe do some some mapping things and all that, but it's gonna it's gonna have more meaning, right? It's just the simple act of memorizing where these things are, these arbitrary names. Like we'll talk about when we get into political geography, how uh, so much of this stuff is just arbitrary anyway. It's you know somebody in power decided to name this place a certain thing and draw this line in a certain place and all that. So look, here's the point. Here's here's the point to my rambling and reminiscing here. Geography as a subject, it's not healthy. It's not useful. 
Uh, and sadly, we just, this is what we introduce you to. Um, you know, we as a society, the greater, greater education system. Um, yeah, that's, that's not healthy. What's better is to think of geography as a discipline, right? Uh, and so this discipline idea is more of a, it's an approach, it's a way of thinking, right? It's this thinking spatially idea, some of the stuff I was introducing last time in that previous lecture. So we're studying the world, but not just to memorize some facts, it's we're trying to see things that could not be seen otherwise, right? That's the idea. And, and one thing that Steve gets into in talking about this is we've just, we've got cool stuff. Uh, he's, he's really into um, mapping and GIS and spatial analysis, using that to study the cultural world, study what's what's around us, right? So we've, we've got some fun toys that we get to play with, and I'll, I'll introduce you to some of these, um, if not, you know, right now in this thing, in future lectures. We'll see examples of this stuff, all right? So that's our, our concept here. We're not going to be looking at geography as a subject. And I know for a lot of you, you probably signed up for this class to, to do that, right? Thinking, eh, I'll learn where some stuff is. Fantastic. That should be an easy, easy three units. Um, yeah, we're not doing that. No, we're going to use geography as a discipline to understand the world around us. That is our goal. Now, one issue we've had is that geography, uh, we've, we've had an identity crisis since the beginning. This is one field that has changed quite a bit, right? And I don't mean just like in like, we learn new things and that changes our ideas of stuff. No, like our whole approach, our sense of what we do, it's changed from day one. Like we start out with geography being what we'd call descriptive, in that you, you, you get out in there in the world just to see what's out there, right? To see what a new place is like, to describe it, to study it, to try to understand it. Uh, and this is, you know, with geography, um, you know, in this country, we're, we're approaching it from a very European <coughs> colonial sense, uh, in, in the sense that it really took off in this Western tradition uh, with European expansion and exploration and colonialism, right? You, you're learning about these other places so that you can, you know, take them over, steal the land and resources from the brown folks who uh, already live there and, and use it to enhance your empire, right? A lot of this early geography, really, it was, it was uh, all based around the idea of resources, of wealth, of taking from this place to enhance one's own empire, right? That's especially with like environmental geography stuff. Um, there was a, a big, big push to learn about things like forests uh, and ecosystems and, and all of that simply to make sure that the forests stay healthy so you can keep cutting this stuff down to make more ships to continue to go fight battles and, and take over people, right? Like that's, that's where a lot of this comes from. Um, so we, we tend to romanticize it a little bit, just this idea of exploring, just to explore. Quite often it was evil. Um, I mean, this guy right here was, was not evil. Um, from what I've read, from, from what I can tell, you, you always got to be hesitant uh, with this stuff and, and looking to the past and idolizing people. But, well, I mean, you know who this guy is, right? You guys know who we're looking at right here? Who is this? Who is this guy? right here on the screen. You wanna to say to you, are you embarrassed? Okay, you don't have to say it by yourself. let's just all together. Alexander von Humboldt. Did you say it with me? Yeah, you did. You know that, you don't know this guy? Yeah, that's another issue with geography is we've had some rock stars in our ranks um, and we let that get away. Like our PR is terrible. Terrible, um, god awful stuff. Do you guys? I don't know if you heard the howling um, outside my door. I, I have a husky. I think who is uh, 
fussy. Hold on one second. Let me let me let me check the dog. Okay, dog's happy. Um, all right. So, uh, so anyway, so so Von Humboldt here. Um, he he was fantastic in the sense that you know all the stuff I said about just going out there to to see where stuff was um, to in order to take it and use it for empire. Humboldt. He, he didn't. That's a dog sneezing. Now she's uh, really helping uh, the process here. So Humboldt here wasn't about stealing and taking and wealth and all that. He truly believed in the idea of knowledge and learning and learning more and understanding and sharing this stuff. He was cool as hell. Um, and everybody loved him. Like anytime you see the name Humboldt, like Humboldt County in Northern California, that's our closest um, uh, reference point right here. It's named for this guy. Uh, there's statues of him all over the world, on multiple continents. Like in the early 1800s, this guy was the man, this rock star of the world, this superstar. Uh, he was so, so uh, um, famous and well-known and, and well-loved and all that. Like Thomas Jefferson, he's president at the time, who was a pretty big deal himself, uh, he worshipped Humboldt, thought he was fantastic, begged him to come visit the United States to see this new country, to see what we were doing and building this place of based on reason and, and scientific knowledge and, and things like that. And Humboldt came, and he thought Jefferson was a nice enough guy, although he had one issue with him. Um, any idea what Humboldt didn't like? Uh, slavery. Right, that was the whole thing. Like Jefferson seems like he seems like a smart guy, but what's his deal with this racist slavery thing here that he's he's doing? Humboldt, a German, mind you. That's always fascinating to see how things have changed. Uh, he was adamant in this idea that race was stupid, that this idea of, of you know racial superiority and all that was was baseless. There was no scientific merit. He was disgusted by Thomas Jefferson's ownership of slaves. Um, that says a lot. I, think. I mean, that shows what a, a brilliant guy this was and how with this idea, like when we get into more directly talking about racism and race and, and all of that stuff, it goes to show there were plenty of people who studied these things and, and knew that this was all nonsense, you know, hundreds of years prior to today, right? When we think of we're like this you know, advanced and enlightened people. Now, we've been talking about this stuff for centuries, but you also have some, you know, in quotes, smart people who still go along with the idea of racism and racial superiority and, and so on, right? It, it's something to think about. Uh, it helps to kind of explain, like, why it's been so persistent. Uh, we'll get more into that. But so anyway, we have this descriptive geography thing, and it's good for... A while but then it's like okay white folks kind of went all around the uh, world we started you know documenting all this stuff and, and, and we did it we did a pretty good job of explaining what was out there so geography needed to change and so when we go to the early 20th century uh, we we really start to see a kind of end of the 19th century early 20th century we see this push for scientific geography doing it more, again, getting into it as a disciplinary thing where it's actually of value. It's not just describing stuff. We're, we're really learning about the world. Uh, so we have what's called environmental determinism. Uh, and it's it's the idea that your environment in which you, you know, are raised, in which you live, in which your culture develops, that's going to connect to really what your culture is. Right there, there's this causal relationship between um, your culture and the place in which your culture developed. Right, and and again, looking at it in a scientific kind of way, really studying the environment to scientifically study culture. 
and we've got the sort of an Ellen Semple here is is this early proponent. And I like to point out we got Humboldt who was you know progressive as hell when it came to you know race and, and things like that, um, as well as just you know wanting to share knowledge with everybody. But we got a woman geographer. Like what a great great field, right? But does does environmental determinism does that make sense? Do you, do you guys follow that? Is that uh, is that clicking? What it, it it probably isn't. I wish I could see you. God, and this is, and I realize too. I'm forgetting about this. Sitting here, at home by myself, you know, not actually seeing you, my AVC students. Um, you know, I can't see you, so I can't see your eyes kind of like gloss over if you're getting it or or not. Right? I, I you know, look. I'm sorry uh, about this. I, I I tend to just go like a little too faster. I forget who you are. My, my little desert students, the fact that you were raised here in this this place, this edge of the barren Mojave Desert, I I get I get your pain. I mean I don't I don't want to get it. I didn't experience it. I grew up, you know, far from here in in northern California, a place where they have trees and 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 happiness and and things like like I grew up in a really a beautiful part of. The world, and that's I think that's why a lot of this, you know, it, it comes naturally to me, and I just I get it, and I'm, I'm this is why I'm teaching, right? And you're learning. I'll put that in quotes because you're desert people. You grew up in this this hellhole, and therefore your brains didn't fully develop, right? And that's what. Look, don't worry about it. I don't want to hold this against you. It's nature. It's science. It's geography. I can't hold this against you. So just, just you know what? As long as you just play these videos and you fake it and you check in with like attendance on canvas and all that stuff i'll give you all a c just for try and bless your hearts because you're dumb desert people right this is the best you can do bless your hearts um and scene right now okay now I, I don't really i don't really feel that way i was just playing um right there but that's that's the problem that is environmental determinism like at first it might sound like oh yeah yeah where you um you grow up that's that's connected to uh um you know how you think about the world and you know that sounds harmless um but it was taken to very racist uh ends right so we went from from the geography of, of guys like Humboldt. i mean not not everybody was as great as Humboldt, but just this idea of learning about the world too Let's try to scientifically prove why these people are inferior and it's okay for us to take their resources, go to war with them, enslave them, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, All right? So, so environmental determinism, not a good thing at all. Uh, it, it, and it was rejected. Uh, and, you know, in the early 20th century, we, we get past this and and like Carl Sauer and uh, as well as Franz Boas and some of those folks I talked about last time um you know they were big in pushing against this concept all right hold on I got a um I got a kid knocking on the door hold give me one a second good lord Sorry about that. I had a uh, four-year-old with a uh, wet stuffed animal. I don't know how the stuffed animal got wet. Uh, I don't really care um, at this point. Let's move on, shall we? Okay, I'm sure that's the last interruption we'll have for this very professional uh, lecture that you're uh, viewing right now. So anyway, so this environmental determinism thing, racist as hell, uh, and it was switched with this concept of environmental, environmental possibilism, God, these names are the worst. We, we, again, we need better PR people. Um, but it's the idea that, yes, your environment will dictate something about your culture, right? How you view the world. Like, you know, being raised, growing up, I mean, your culture develop in the Arctic versus, uh, you know, some, some low-latitude desert there's a, a rainforest, whatever. Like, you're just, yeah, there's going to be stuff you think about differently, focus differently, you know, that kind of stuff. Sure, 
but it doesn't mean that you're that's it like you have a limit to your development to your ability to reason to be intelligent you know that kind of stuff that these environmental determinists were doing so sure of course we're geographers right we're looking at how the environment plays a role but we're not going to get hung up on this idea that that environment is everything right and like we have no free will or or anything like that it's it's all you know places connected to your your inner dna your biology that's garbage right it's this idea of environmental possibilism okay and that's so that's the rejection but honestly with this like environmental determinism stuff it, it's like what we do is we freak out when this kind of stuff happens so really what geography then becomes is what we call regional geography and it's the idea this is when if you're a geographer you would you would learn about you know geographic concept these methods of geography and all of that but you'd pick a, a place as your your uh, that's your specialty that's your concentration like you would be a geographer of east asia or south america or you know whatever right that's that's what you would do so you'd pick a place and then really what your job is is to learn every single thing about it right every little fact and and bit of trivia and all that uh, and so this is where we start to see that idea of geography as a subject and this is like you know 1930s is when it's kind of starting into the 40s and 50s and this is this is garbage uh, right here. This is that boring, just useless kind of stuff. This is around the same time that Harvard um, decided that uh, uh, we don't need geography anymore. They got rid of geography. It was like a major or a, you know concentration, I think is what they, they call it at a place like Harvard because they're too good um, for a term like major. That's, I, I believe... Um, yeah, and we, we geographers, we've always kind of, it's been an issue. That's been like, well, oh, Harvard doesn't like it. Like, that's a big blow to our sense of worth. Um, you know, to be honest, you know, as you, you start to learn more about this stuff, you kind of start to realize, that, oh, maybe maybe um, maybe it's good to be rejected by Harvard. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, it's the idea that this is what geography really, it's not doing well. Uh, right here it just becomes this boring useless thing it's got to change right time to change so what do we do we flip out uh, and we go to the extreme we have what's called the quantitative revolution which is uh, really it's it's this decision to you know what no we're not gonna do this subject nonsense we're gonna be positivists uh, and we're just gonna look at numbers and data we're gonna be sciency as hell to make sure because we want Harvard, take us back. Come on, baby. You, you know, we, we had some good times before, and we we're all environmental determinists and, and being racist and all that. We'll go back to numbers, right? We'll tone down the racism, but we'll have the, the numbers. So that's that's our push. And honestly, Harvard didn't bite. Um, there's still no, like, Department of Geography there, as, as far as I know. They do some, like, GIS and some mapping stuff. They like this quantitative stuff, but when it comes to, like, the good parts of geography... Um, yeah, Harvard doesn't care. They're lost. Look, so the, the point is we, we get super science. In this book right here, Explanation in Geography, was uh, an important one to help um, kind of guide this, this push into being very scientific. It's written by David Harvey. I, I point this out because he'll come up in a, another slide or two. I just want to bring your attention to that now but this whole idea of being positivist it's it's the idea where we're, we're trying to model the world we're looking for generalizations we're trying to link stuff together this is a classic example i don't know when this actually came into being if it was right there in like the 60s when this quantitative revolution is happening or it's taking place later but this is this is the kind of stuff that quantitative revolution is really pushing for. We still see this today in some parts of, of geographic research, um, but this is a, a model of Latin American cities, not a specific one. We're not looking at Lima or Buenos Aires or, or you know, 
whatever. Um, it's, these, are, these are Latin American cities. Uh, and so what we have here is it's, you've got the blue in here, the CBD, which is an unfortunate acronym these days. It's the central business district or commercial business district. Uh, it's the downtown area, right? And so in this area, and then you've got this spine radiating outward, this is where the wealth is. Okay? It's in the center of the city, and it kind of comes out a little bit, and you have this elite residential sector here. So this is the wealthy folks right here. They're in the center and kind of radiating out in one area. This zone of maturity would be, you know, it's, it's, it's the middle class folk, right? We're not talking super wealthy, but it's a nice place to live and grow up. Four right here is, you know, these are kind of working class people who bless their hearts are trying hard, you know, but no, they're not quite middle class yet. And then five here, this peripheral zone, that's the, the poor folk, right? Below working class, these are the squatter uh, uh, settlements where just, you know, the impoverished just go and they just start building a house, um, you know, a step up from being homeless uh, effectively. Um, so that, the, the idea is you take this model, if we were to take this and overlay it on top of, you know, any of these Latin American cities, we, we you know, take Santiago and we, we put it on top there, it should look more or less like this. Like, we don't expect the lines to be perfect, but you'll see this trend, right? So a few things of this. Number one, I like to point out when we're actually in a classroom is, you know, think about it, does this work? outside of Latin America, can we use this in the US? No would be the answer when you think about it. Um, we're almost the opposite here, and then our wealthy folk, we don't you know, put our wealthy folk in the center of a city, that's ridiculous. The wealthy folk leave the city, um, they're on the outside, and you keep the poor people on the inside, right? It would be the opposite in terms of wealth and poverty um, for US cities. So it's one warning, is just when you see stuff like this, you know, you want to be aware. There's no, with especially with humanity, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of deal. There's no one model that explains everything. But I'll also say one issue with this kind of stuff, like, well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of cool, it's kind of fun when you start to recognize patterns and things like that, is this does nothing to explain how we got here. And, yeah, there's the... Husky again now really says she loves she loves the discussion of the, the quantitative revolution. Hey, hey, Mora, quiet. All right, so so it's the idea that with this, while it's it's cute and all, it erases um, the history that brought this into being. It erases a lot of the contextual stuff. We're just looking at, hey, look at this cool um, you know, pattern that I found, right? Isn't that neat? And we just kind of move from there. Okay, so what happened, and this was in response to some of this stuff, um, was that like, you know, this is all great and all, but we're just really, we're still just describing the world around us. It's kind of like this regional thing. We're pointing out this cute little stuff, but we don't know why it's the case. And therefore, if it's stuff like trying to fix things, we're dealing with stuff like, you know, poverty in a city, um, and trying to get rid of it, trying to help bring poor people out of poverty, that kind of stuff. Uh, this doesn't help at all, right? Just knowing like where the poor folks are. That's, I mean, that's step one of like a 50 step process to get people out of that poverty, right? So we reject the quantitative revolution and we, we have what's called the cultural turn, okay? Which is where we're getting into thinking about culture in a different way, thinking about geography in a different way, and we're rejecting this idea of just scientific description. And an important book here, uh, Social Justice and the City, written by that same guy, David Harvey. And one thing I like about Harvey and his uh, work, I don't see eye to eye with him on everything. He's still, you know, working today, a very important human cultural geographer. Um, but, but one thing I think is very admirable is that he has this book, is very successful uh, here, kind of you know steers geography one way. But then 
he doesn't hesitate to say, you know what? No, I was wrong. Completely wrong. I made a mistake. Here's how we're going to do it. Right? We're going to focus in enough of this sciencey stuff. Like we can still use numbers and, and logical reasoning and stuff like that. But let's get into, you know, this this more of a materialist approach. That's his thing. And it's just it's very rare in academia for someone to to have success and then admit that he or she was wrong. Right, with that thing that brought them success. Right, so that's I think that's admirable. But what we have here, it's not just Harvey and what he's doing. It's a few different ways to approach this. We really we have a focus on either sense of place. So we'll get into what that is, or this concept of critical thought. And and critical thinking is a term that we use way too much in college, um, like here at ABC and other, um, you know, institutions, this idea of teaching people to think critically. We love to say that. It's a great way to get, you know, grant funding and to, to make the state of California happy with what we're doing and all that. But we don't, no one understands what, what thinking critically actually means or how we go about them. So I'll, I'll get into that, what that is, what that means, how, how we use that, right? But these are the two big changes with this cultural turn and this really while while many people would say we're not still you know here we i don't even know what people say we're in currently this cultural turn the some of the foundations that were set forth here and this is in the late 70s 80s 90s this is where we see a lot of this stuff it's still relevant today and i think this is where the good geography work is centered right around these these kinds of things not completely here there's a lot of stuff that these folks mixed missed but but this is the approach we're going for we should be going for all right so first the sense of place thing it's the idea when we say sense of place we're saying that a place it's unique it has its own sense of place, its own uniqueness, its own qualities that make it unlike any other place out there. Okay? An important geographer here uh, is Yifu Tuan, um, who came up with the term topophilia, which of course it, it always sounds dirty uh, to me, but it simply means it's a love of place, right? And this term placeness is that sense of place. It's what makes a place unique. Okay? And we'll spend time on that. You have uh, coming up in future weeks, this Antelope Valley sense of place assignment that uh, I'll, I'll be talking about, you know, more in depth. So don't worry about that. We'll continue to come back to this, this term, but it's, it's simply this idea of what makes a place unique. Um, and I think I, I may have mentioned this already in previous lectures, but it's, it's stuff like, uh, uh, you know, McDonald's, these chain restaurants and stores and, and stuff. Um, they, they're kind of, you know, they're homogenous in the sense that you kind of know what to expect and all that. But a true, true uh, student of, of this idea of sense of place and, and uh, what's, what's called humanist geography um, would say that no, no, there's no such thing as like the same McDonald's. They're all relatively unique because of whatever reason, right? Whatever thing is there. Now, that's not to say that they're not meant to get rid of that sense of place. And so Ted Relvier had this, this concept of placelessness where he's getting into the, the act of eliminating a sense of place, right? In the same, you know, McDonald's, whatever, right? Whatever restaurant store thing uh it might be and and you know mcdonald's is the classic one but you can think of anything i mean of course i'm recording this you're most likely listening to this during this whole covid19 pandemic so you know maybe going into places like this it's hard to remember but any any store that is you know a chain of some kind where there's more than one of these things they all kind of have that where they're designed to to eliminate that really it's it's for a, a sense of comfort it's so you can go in you're not you know there's you eliminate the mystery danger and stuff with you know are you going to get a good deal are they going to have what you want that kind of stuff 
Um, so Ralphier studied that and really got into this, this concept of, of trying to design places without that. But ultimately, uh, what a lot of folks in this school of thought were doing was saying, no, there's no, um, there's no such thing. As a, a really a, a truly placeness, placeless place. Uh, again, these these terms are the worst. Um, but it's it's the idea of uh, um, you know they're they're meant to be that way, but you're still going to experience something, something unique, something new. Uh, and it all goes back to that idea of phenomenology, which I talked about in the previous lecture. That idea of going out there and experiencing. The world. If you want to learn about the sense of place, you can't simply look at data. You can't simply sit back and you know read a book about it or whatever. You gotta go there, right? It's the idea. We go back to like that that uh, Latin American city model. You can't understand what some you know South American city is like just by looking at that model. You gotta actually go there and meet the people and, and see the sights and smell the smells and, and all of that. Right, that's the push. So, with that, we're going to come back to this idea because there's some use in here even today. It's not it's not a perfect way of using geography and approaching, but it's it's something we can utilize. All right, this other side, this whole critical geography thing, uh, it's it's really a question of power and ideology. Right, it goes back to that question we had of who belongs in the landscape, whose culture is being represented in the landscape. It's all about who holds the power, who has the power to control space and place around us, right? That's what really critical geography is. And, and truly, to think critically, right, this idea of critical thought that we push so much, it's ultimately, it's all about power, Right, or at least it should be. Um, when we think critically about something, we should be questioning, you know, why is this here? Why is this this way? Who benefits from it being this way? That kind of stuff. Uh, we don't really do that. We just say, you know, we want you to think critically, and then we give you like a tricky word problem or something and think that's good enough. No, we're getting into what's what's really going on here. Why is this the way it is, right? And when we do this, when we start to look at issues of power um, in society around us, in the culture, in the built environment, all of that stuff, we've got this term, which is useful, this, this concept, um, the marginalize, right? Which can be used too much sometimes, like in grad school and all that. People like to uh, uh, use it a little too much. It's kind of a catch-all term. Um, so we don't want to, you know, overuse it, but it is a useful concept to think about, um, that if we do have somebody in power, or some group in power, or whatever, um, and so this dog is driving me crazy, um, but if we do have somebody in power, we also have to have people out of power, uh, you know, the idea that there are people excluded from this power, that's the, um, that's the idea, so to be marginalized, it's a group that doesn't have access to, you know, like, you know, power itself, the power to decide things, define things, whatever. It's, it's people who don't have access to wealth. Um, hold on, this, uh, the dog is, is free. I think she's, she just wants to wrestle. That's, that's all it is. I'm not wrestling with her right now. Let me let her out uh, real quick. Hold on. Okay, come on. Come on, let's go. Okay, so now the dog's happy. She just ran away thinking we were going to play, and I, I tricked her and feel awful. But we're, we're going to wrap up here soon. So don't worry. The dog's, the dog's fine. This is the thing that drives me crazy uh, is that I know when I have, like, animal noises and, and stuff going on uh, with these things, that's all you can fixate on. Uh, so I apologize. But the, the dog's fine. She's, she's happy and healthy. We'll go for a run later. Um, it'll be great. Okay, so anyway, so... We're looking at who's got the power, who doesn't got the power, right? And when we're, we're doing this in geography, it's uh, sometimes it's, it, we look at things the way 
one might think, but there's also, there's, there's more subtle. So, well, it's not even subtle, in, you know, in, it, but it's when, it's only when you really look at it that you start to go, oh yeah, that is, that is messed up. Um, one thing that we see quite a bit when we start to study just maps and places and stuff like that critically is that there are some names out there that are messed up. All right, and so a toponym, it literally means place name, all right? What do we call a place, all right? The name of a place. Some of these things don't matter at all, or at least don't appear to, right? The city of Lancaster or Palmdale, you know, is that kind of what's in a name? I mean, I think the story with Palmdale... I think is that like some of the first people to discover the place thought that these Joshua trees were palm trees and that's why they named it that and it's kind of a reminder of how clueless the first palm dalians actually were. It's kind of embarrassing. Lancaster, I mean, talk about boring. That's just uh, that's a name that's been repeated over and over and you know so that's not unique. It's just named either after you know Pennsylvania or England or wherever. Uh, you know, the original one was that the people who named this one Lancaster were referencing, like, not that exciting. But then you got stuff like this, like this, this sign right here. This is one I saw often growing up, again, in Northern California, driving along Highway 50 with my, you know, in the backseat, parents driving, uh, we'd be, you know, driving from where I grew up into like Sacramento or wherever, and we'd, um, We'd pass this sign, and I, and I got to a point where I, I read the sign, Negro Bar, and and said, what? No. No. No, you can't say that. that I, I, we were taught that that's, that's not cool. Uh, and yet there it is on this official government sign. I remember asking my parents, like, why? 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 And my parents, doing what most parents do, they said, huh, that's interesting. And then they turned up the music in the car, you know, got me a happy meal to make me forget about it or whatever, just changed the subject because that's just easier to do with kids. Um, but yeah, stuff like this always bugged me. And that's me. I'm just a, you know, a little white kid uh, seeing this. So it doesn't bug me in the way like I feel oppressed. It's more of like, you know, the hypocrisy of it. You know, maybe there's a little little bit of the social justice in there when I'm, you know, eight or whatever looking at it. Um, but still, I mean, like ultimately wasn't a, a huge deal to my own childhood, my own formation and all of that. Right. Um, but others driving along that same freeway, seeing that other little eight or nine year old or however old I was when I really, you know, recognized this, those who had darker skin than I have, uh, they're not going to be able to just, you know, go, oh, you know, oh, well, whatever, move on, right? Uh, it, there's a lot of power there. And in looking at this, I've since researched it just because this specific one bugged me. Um, but it's the idea that, uh, you know, that it was where the, uh, uh, there was one black family in like Gold Rush era um, times in this part. This is where the actual California Gold Rush started or pretty close to the, the, where it actually took off. So a lot of people came to the area to do the mining and all that. And you had a black family who had a store. They had like a, you know, a little store thing along the American river. Um, and so they didn't name it, right? Because they didn't have the ability to name it, but the locals there named it Negro bar for this little like sandbar area where, the one black family was very, very clever, very creative, right? And to be honest, this particular N word is the tamer of uh, the other choices that people typically, white folk typically chose for these names. Um, but yeah, so it's in reference to this one black family in the area, and that's power, right? I mean, that's uh, they, the family themselves, didn't have the ability to name it whatever it was they wanted. It was the white folks, the people who had the power in this area, they had the ability to name it. And then what's really messed up is not just that, you know, some people in, you know, 1849 um, decided to, to name this this way. Like we can look back uh, at this period in time and say, ah, yeah, they were all racist. They were all awful. And blah, 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 blah. But we haven't changed it. 
right? As far as I know, it's been a while since they've been up there looking specifically at this area. Maybe we've since changed it. There was a push to finally get rid of this stuff over the last few years. Um, yeah, over the last few years, right? Like in modern times, we finally decided back in the 90s that maybe we should change this stuff. But it was a case where when, you know, the federal government started mapping this stuff out and, and making official signs in different places became, you know, states as opposed to territories and so on. They just used these local names for places. And if they were horribly offensive to one group, federal government didn't care, whatever. Um, the, the federal government, as we'll see, has had plenty of racist and sexist and just all around awful policies, official policies, uh, and, and that's gotten us to where we are today. It's a good way to understand things like the Black Lives Matter movement, the protests that have been going on throughout 2020. A lot of it can be explained through these official policies that we've had. It's, and it's not as simple as if only we had changed these names of these places, you know, 100 years ago, racism wouldn't exist. It's not that simple. But it's just, it's important to point out that the federal government has not been the most progressive in um, a lot of these concepts. And to say that, it's worth saying, is not to say um, that therefore America is, is evil uh, and it's a terrible country and blah, 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 right? Because people get defensive when you start to criticize this country, they they think that oh, you must say, why don't you move to, to you know the Soviet Union, to, to Venezuela if you don't like it here? This is the stupidest thing in the world. Um, uh, a, I mean, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. So I mean, come on, pal. Um, but also, like this country was, it was founded on criticism and dissent and, and all that. Like it's kind of that's our jam, right? That's what we do. Um, but it's also it's important to realize that. We're not saying that this whole place is a sham. We're just simply saying that at certain points in time, we had some awful people do some awful stuff. And if we fix it, eh, maybe we'll, we'll be a better country, right? It, it's kind of as simple as that. So that's when we're thinking critically about geography. Let's just say about, you know, California geography stuff around us. This is what we're doing. We're just, we're looking at what's there. We're questioning the power. We're, we're asking who's marginalized, who doesn't have the power. And sometimes it's, you know, you, you tend to kind of hear like, you know, power, who holds the power and all that. It tends to, to express this conspiratorial kind of vibe. You, like you picture some, you know, a few wealthy men in a room making decisions and, and at the expense of everybody else. Um, no, it's not that simple, right? But there's definitely, there's power out there. And one good way to understand power, don't make sense of it, uh, it's this term hegemony. Okay? Another term that can be overused way too much, but an incredibly important term. It's one, uh, um, you know, it's worth, worth knowing simply to help make sense of why stuff sucks or, you know, why stuff the way is the way it is and so on. And, and Gramsci here, um, good old Antonio, uh, he didn't come up with the term, but he helped to develop it. So it's his use of it. That's how we use it. And Gramsci, he was, uh, he was writing from prison. He, he has what are called the, the prison notebooks, which is, you know, sexy as hell. Um, but it's the idea he was, you know, fighting fascism and, you know, Mussolini and all those, you know, the bad guys, uh, in Italy, um, and criticizing their, you know, his rise to power and this, this idea of fascism and he got arrested for it, but he was able to write and his journals were smuggled out and, and all of that. And so he's, he's, what he's studying is like, how did this happen? How can you get, um, back to, you know, an, an dare I say, anti-fascist way of life? Uh, there's a, there's a term that's, oddly complicated in, uh, you know, 2020 America right now, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and so one of the things he's talking about is this idea of hegemony, which is simply how a group, right, somebody in power can rule and dominate another group without actual violence, right, without like sheer force. You don't have to hold a gun to someone's head to get them to do something. There are other ways, 
right? And so a few key terms are consent, right? It's the idea that those being ruled, those outside of power, they consent to this power, right? Whether it makes sense for them or not, right? But it's, there's, a, there's a move there. There's something this group did to convince this other group to, to let them be in control, right? And, and so it's, it's a big thing here. One of the key things with this idea of hegemony that, that I think is, is overlooked or it has been overlooked for a while. Like when I was learning this stuff in uh, college, like in my undergraduate days, this term came up. Nobody really knew. It seemed like what it meant, like the professors or, you know, grad students who were TAs or whatever. They'd, they'd use this term, but I always remember it just kind of it sounded generic. And that could have been, it's not me saying like I was smarter than everybody. Um, it could really have been I was just a lazy, terrible student and I didn't bother to to ask a follow-up question or whatever. And maybe they were, you know, knew exactly what they were talking about. But still, one thing that always bugged me was it just kind of, this was just thrown out there as like, yeah, one group's in control. End of story, right? But it's really about this idea of of consent, right? As Gramsci is, is developing this. Uh, and also... A key thing here is that stuff is made to seem natural, right? That is a huge, huge part right here. That that whatever the, the rule of one group uh, is seen as a natural thing because, you know, that's just how it is. Okay? One thing that, that bugs the hell out of me right now, um, well, one thing I'm fascinated by is this whole idea of abolishing the police, defunding the police, um, this uh, um, push, this movement that is, you know, it's kind of, it's not mainstream at all, but the fact that it's even being discussed um, in a mainstream way, I think that is fascinating. I myself, I'm like working on stuff, um, researching just this idea of, of police, Right, the the fact that we tend to think of a police force as being natural, and that's not me, you know, saying I'm I'm saying this in a way. It's very academic, um, which is a, a you know can be cowardly uh, as well. But I'm not like I'm not before you freak out either way. I'm not saying like you know burn down all the police stations and, and all that stuff. Uh, I'm also, you know, not saying that like yeah you know you know we need more of our, our police. Um, it's an issue where we've kind of, we take it for granted that a police force, a strong police force with, you know, the riot gear and, and, you know, helicopters and stuff like that. We, we kind of just say, yeah, we need it. Right. It's become, it's been made natural, um, to think that, yeah, there are bad people out there. So we need this stuff. And I'm not saying there aren't bad people out there. Um, but what I'm questioning is just that that concept, right, of bad people, of needing the police to deal with those bad people and all that, right? That's that's what I'm trying to study and make sense of, and that's what some folks are doing. Now, at the end of this, I might come to the conclusion, no, it actually, it makes sense. We need, if anything, we should get the police force stronger. But on the other hand, you might go, yeah, actually, this is, you know, based on some of this stuff, and, and while we need a police presence and and yeah we need police with with guns and, and all that we don't need it in this form we have today right that's the thing like we take what we have today and we just assume yeah that's how it's supposed to be right because that's the way it has been since i've been alive for this you know short period of time and all that so that's the the real use um of thinking about hegemony it, it's how you can have um a group with some power and a group without power. I mean, we can say that, that the police have power. I don't, right? I'm, I consider myself to be a law-abiding citizen, but I've had issues where it's a case where, uh, um, you know, I got no power. If a cop wants me to do something, I got to do it, right? And, and that's me as a, you know, uh, straight, white, uh, you know, relatively well-off individual right without some of them the markers uh that could get you in trouble if you get the wrong cop right um yeah i don't have any of that uh, and i still got no power 
in that sense. And, and I've given consent to this all my life. And it's just, it's simply a question of, is that, is that the right thing to do? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it needs to be changed just a little bit. Maybe the whole thing needs to be torn down, right? Like these are the, this is what we're working toward when we think critically about stuff. And it's not a, you know, necessarily good thing or bad thing. It's just, it's a way to question what's going on around us and to be intellectuals about it. All right. I think that's good enough for now. Um, yeah. Hegemony. We'll come back. To, we'll come back to all this stuff in future weeks. We'll we'll really start getting into you know examples. The next time we'll get we'll really address what's going on with Steve's book. Um, we'll get into we'll get into the Yoda shit, right? We'll we'll talk about all this stuff. We'll 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 cover a, a bunch of that. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be less like fight the man kind of stuff, and more just about you know what is it, what is it we're doing? Kind of an an outline of of geography. All right. And I'll, I'll make sure that, uh, uh, no dogs and no small children, uh, interrupt that one at all. Right. With, uh, either, either threat of sheer force or I'll use my, uh, hegemony to, uh, to get them to behave, right. Which any good parent should be able to do. All right. Geographers talk to you later.